Good morning, students. I was talking about how much I was enjoying the uh, the cool weather, and and now we we've got some uh, spring weather coming back. Uh, this morning it was like 72 degrees, so I had gotten accustomed to 40 degrees, and and that was again not a problem. I mean, I've I've learned to adjust, but uh, I guess we'll have a few days of warmer weather, and hopefully we'll get back to some of that cooler morning weather. Uh, what we want to do today is continue our work uh, with power functions as we extend them to power series. And uh, the last example that we did um, with the Taylor's theorem that turned out to be a geometric progression is actually a nice segue into this. So um, I want to take that example and work with it and see how we can look at power series in general. And also about the fourth test, I will say more about that. Uh, the uh, work that you did for the third test was just a dry run, a trial run. It had no impact on your grade. Uh, what I did was assess it to give you some idea of how I felt about your uh, turned in work. Uh, for the fourth test, there will be a component uh, of the uh, grade for that test that, that the work will count. And I will say more about that. Uh, again, the, the idea is to make sure that you're writing mathematics and writing coherent mathematics uh, as any STEM professional would need to do, especially when you all become engineers and computer scientists and, and professional mathematicians. I want you to be able to, to communicate well uh, with your colleagues and, and, and show them that you have command of what you're doing. Okay, so what I want to do now is share my screen and talk some about the example <clears throat> that we ended with last time and then go into a more general uh, discussion of power series. So remember, we had this function f of x equals 1 divided by one plus X. And we wanted to figure out a Taylor, Taylor polynomial that would actually uh, give us accuracy within one over a hundred. And we were dealing with uh, X equal one fifth. And I said, well, we can just substitute and find the exact value and then compare that uh, to the approximated value. And we saw that we had the uh, error that, that we needed. Uh, for that particular computation. But what, what I want to highlight here <clears throat> is that the second order polynomial, Taylor polynomial, look like this. And of course, if we keep going, there's no reason for you to expect that this would just be an alternating series of powers of x. So the next term would be the negative x cubed plus x to the fourth, etc. And so you're thinking, okay, well, that's really good because we did the Taylor's theorem to analyze the remainder and also to figure out these coefficients. And that was a lot of work. The, we had to figure out a general form for the derivative. And then, then I changed the way I actually finished the problem and said, okay, we need to make sure all of our ends are correct. And, and we, we were able to reduce it to something manageable. Now, you might be thinking, why can't we just look at this as a geometric series and work backwards? And, and if you're thinking that, you're exactly right. And we will make big use of that connection uh, as we move through power series. But what we want to do now is to think you know, we, we could get pretty lucky and say, okay, well, we know that when X for a power series in absolute value is less than one, then we have a convergent real series. Okay, so that the fact that this is geometric, we would say, okay, well, let's just go ahead and write out what we know this to be. So we could go ahead and put in and this is a technique I'm gonna say more about soon. I just wanna go ahead and introduce it to you. We can write this as a sum, the one minus A divided by one minus R. And then when we do that, we're thinking, okay, well, the A is one and the R is the additive inverse of X. And so then we're thinking, okay, that's just the series if we start at zero. 
we have negative x to the n. And then, of course, we can factor the negative 1. And write this as negative 1 to the n, x to the n. And this will generate an infinite series, which is a power series. And then you say, oh, we have the theorem from section 2 of chapter 9. We would know this would converge when the r or the x is less than 1. And then we'd say, OK, well, that's an interval of convergence, negative 1 to 1. And then we might think, well, we probably don't have to worry about the endpoints because if we if we were to substitute, we would get series that clearly diverged. But at least we're looking at this and saying we had the theory of the geometric series to figure out where this particular series would converge because we connected it with a geometric series from our previous work. And this is a huge connection, which again, we're going to exploit often. So my question to you would be, what if we didn't have this connection? What if we have a power series, but it's not geometric, we don't have the connection, and we want to figure out where it converges? How, how would we do that uh, without having some kind of previous knowledge? Well, we need to set up some theory for that, and that's what we're going to do right now. So let's look at a general power series. So we're thinking, you know, when we work with the Taylor polynomials, we started with a general polynomial and showed what the coefficients must be if it's going to agree with f and its first n derivatives at the point x equals c. And so we're thinking, OK, uh, are we going to get that happening all over again? And of course, the answer is yes. So let's take a polynomial in general and extend it. So this will be the general form. And then we're going to figure out using the ratio test, basically how we can figure out an interval of convergence. So here's what we'll do. This is what Dr. Larson uses. We'll do an expansion about C or a center C and just write a, an infinite polynomial. And again, we call this a power series because the terms are powers of X, okay, power series. So we have plus A1, X minus C. So this all looks familiar. So I'm, I'm, I'm just writing something we had for the last class. But this is in general, we're not solving for anything. So we can keep going to uh, the nth power. And then, of course, at infinitum. So when we think about this, we're saying, well, we, when we refer to S of X now, we're going to think of it as the infinite series. That is the power series. And we'll just start at N equals zero because we're lazy. And, you know, for what it's worth, ease is always good. So we'll have a sub n, x minus c to the n. So this is what we call the general power series. So we basically taken a polynomial and extended it to infinite terms. And, you know, it, it, it's interesting, the, the beauty about mathematics, if we get a really good construct, a really nice concept, then, then usually, if, it, if it's one that is just far reaching, we can use it over and over again. So this Taylor series uh, bit will depend completely on the Taylor polynomial. Uh, that is when we get to it. You know, we talk about the, the connection between the convergent power series and its Taylor series. So here's our question. What about convergence? Now, when we, think, when we think of convergence, we're going to think of a radius of convergence. So if we look here, we see that the expansion point here is zero. That is, we're thinking we have this interval centered at zero, and we extend a distance of one on either side. 
So what we're going to think of, and this is to help you with the terminology, is that this distance here from the center to the end point here, we're going to call R for the radius of convergence. Radius of convergence. And so we're thinking, how can we figure out a radius of convergence for a general power series like this? Well, first, what we're going to do is we're going to let, I'm going to use the same letter R, let R be an extended real number. That means it can be infinity. And then what we want to do is say, how, how do we want this to react? For instance, we want our power series to converge on a symmetric interval about C, and then outside that interval, that is, if we go past the endpoints, we want it to diverge. That is, there's got to be some kind of symmetry having to do with the interval of convergence. If, if like I said before, if the convergent power series is going to correspond to the Taylor series, then we're going to have to be forced to have some symmetry. Otherwise, this won't work. I mean, we're thinking if, if this is theory that we've already shown to be true, it will have to follow for all of the other cases. So what we want is let R be an extended real number such that. So we work backwards to figure out what it has to be such that S of X, that is, I'm going to be lazy and call this the power series S of X, converges for all X within R of C, okay, and diverges when we go outside of the interval here, diverges for X minus C in absolute value greater than R. So this is where it's very useful to have the idea of symmetric interval using the conjunction. Now, this is kind of a sensitive argument. We can always figure out an R, but we, we're going to have issues with endpoints. So, so what we're going to think about, we'll, we'll think about convergence. We'll just flesh out this convergence will be corresponding to these x. So if we flesh it out a little bit, we have negative r less than x minus c less than r, and then add c. So we'll have c minus r less than x less than uh, c plus an r. So here you're seeing that this is just one plus zero and then uh, negative one plus zero, so to speak. So this gives us a nice recipe to figure out this interval once we know R. We'll already know C, and once we figure out R, we can write the interval of convergence right here. And then if we have to, well, we have to, we'll check the endpoints. So, so we'll just say uh, checking endpoints is required. That is, we'll just get a real series and then we'll use all of the convergence tests that we've learned before Taylor polynomials to figure that out. So, so we may or may not include these points. So for instance, include or exclude C minus R. We'll have to decide on that and we'll say include <clears throat> or exclude C plus R. So once we figure out the interval, we'll know what the endpoints are and then we'll have to check both of these. Our theory is not going to give us points. Calculus is kind of weird that way. It's we not we have to work on a continuum <clears throat> on an interval 
and then the, the endpoints is just like if you've got a, a Riemann integral and, and the function has a discontinuity at one point, um, you know, in the sense that it's not infinite, then you're fine. If it's just a whole, you, you can basically ignore it. But then, of course, when we did our improper integrals, if the, if the discontinuity were infinite, then we really had an issue and we had to think about how we would define the integral for that type of discontinuity. So, so again, we, we, we never get a whole lot of rest because we always have to check everything. So this kind of sets us up with this. So now thinking about the ratio test, how would we actually figure out what R is. Well, we're gonna make a definition based on the ratio test. And this is how you'll be able to do this. And it's gonna save you plenty of time. So what we're gonna do is this. We're going to define the radius of convergence This is like Taylor's polynomial. It's so important when you do your differential equations, you got to know this. Define the radius of convergence R to be the limit as n tends to infinity of the ratio of the coefficients here, but in reverse, like we're dividing to solve for an x, so to speak. So we're gonna to define to the radius of convergence to be the limit as n tends to infinity of the absolute value of successive terms, except the n term is in the numerator and the n plus one term is in the denominator. And so then we're thinking this, this would be easy now, for instance, if we have certain categories of R, we can now use the ratio test in conjunction with this to figure out the actual interval of convergence. So apply ratio test to S of X. The ratio test is, it, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is, is, is of major importance. Um, we like to apply it because it's easy, but it's, it's important. It, it's, gonna, it's gonna make a huge difference. Uh, in our work. So we have a sub n, x minus c to the n. Now, when we actually apply it, what we're gonna do, since we have an x now, because before we just had a real series, this is going to give us the following. That is, we're gonna have a ratio for every value of x. So we're gonna say little r of x will be the limit as n approaches infinity of, and now this is where we take our ratios. So we'll have a n plus one, we'll have x minus c to the n plus one. For each x, I'll just say for each x we have. So x is fixed. And then we have a n, x minus c to the n. But now, of course, all the powers of x minus c absorb except for one. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity. We can go ahead and break this up. a sub n plus one over a sub n. And then we just have that lone copy of x minus c. And so we can factor that because it has no independence. So the absolute value of x minus c is factored. And now we have here, which is the reciprocal of r. So we can use this to figure out the actual interval of convergence. So let's look at all the possible cases. r is an extended real number. So number one, <laughs> this, is, this is easy now that we've set it up. So if R is zero, that is you don't, you don't go anywhere. That is you say R is zero, so you're only converging at one point. Then, so if R is zero, we're basically, when we flip it, we're dividing by zero, a positive number, and this is becoming, well, 
converging to a positive number from the right. This is becoming infinity. So this says R of X is infinity. If R is zero, then the convergence test here blows up and that's clearly bigger than one. So this implies divergence. So I don't need the then, I just need the implies. S of X diverges for X not equal to C. So we only have one point and that's not very interesting. I mean, it, it, who cares? One point, what, what are we gonna do with that? Now, the other case, the extreme case is actually good. You're thinking, well, this is good. What if we have an infinite radius of convergence? Well, if this is infinity, then it's reciprocal becomes zero. Then R of X is just zero. And that's clearly less than one because remember when, when the limit here, when we apply the ratio test is less than one, that's when we have the absolute convergence. So this implies S of X converges absolutely. for all X. So when we look at that, we're thinking, well, this is, you know, we, we do the computation and like, well, nothing there. We do this computation, we're thinking, well, we've got a really, really nice power series. So that's, that's good. Okay, so nice. Three, what about if R is less than infinity? Now over here, we have the reciprocal of R. So when we take the limit, we just get X minus C in absolute value. And this is just one over R since we define R to be this. So we just have X minus C in absolute value times one over R or absolute value of X minus C divided by R. And then of course we can apply the ratio test. We know we get absolute convergence when this is less than one. So. So we're thinking in this particular case, S of X, and this is starting to look just like what I wrote here. When we think about, let's see, where did I write that? I've got two sets of notes here. This is when we were looking at this, we're gonna get this. S of X converges absolutely I guess this is the interesting case. Four, now we can cross multiply X minus C in absolute value less than R, which is exactly what we talked about before. So I guess when, when we talk about the interesting case, this is when we say, okay, well, if we have a finite radius of convergence, once we have that, all we have to do is solve this. So you compute the radius of convergence. Uh, the book tends to put all this together with all the X's involved. And I find that to be a little bit uh, busy. I don't particularly like it. And so I've revised my arguments here to reflect a, a much more simple way of doing this. But you can choose whichever path you like. I just think ease is always uh, preferable. We have to do so much computation anyway, we might as well uh, decrease it if we can. So, so we're thinking, okay, now when we make this computation here, these cases basically tell us uh, what's going on. We're certainly grateful when we have two. We will have power series that will converge uh, for all real numbers. Uh, and you're not gonna be surprised about that. Um, but, but in most of the cases that you do in this section, uh, the, the radius of convergence will actually not be an extended real number in the sense that it's infinity, it will be finite and we'll have this. And so again, just like I've written here or said before, this will allow us to figure out an interval of convergence except 
it will say nothing about the endpoints. So I'll just say check, like I said before, check convergence at endpoints. And so you, you, get, you get several possibilities. Let's just write them down. If I, if I follow what we had before, we can get, um, in this particular case, I'll use the notation that I've written here. We can have X, excuse me, let me, X is in between all of this. We can say C minus R, C plus R, that would be one case. Maybe we get convergence at the left endpoint, but not the right. That's why I wrote them separately, so I wouldn't have to write and or. Maybe we don't get convergence at the left endpoint, but we do get it at the right. So that would be a case. And then of course, we could get convergence at both endpoints. So, so this is just, this is not the end of the world. Basically what it says is that once you figure this out, you just check real series for, for these numbers. And if you get convergence for the particular number, you include it or you don't. If you get convergence, you include it or you don't. So these would be the possibilities for an interval of convergence. That would always be the case when R is less than infinity. So, so again, a very simple procedure. Not everything has to be complicated uh, and, and this certainly isn't. So, One thing that we're going to do first, and then, then we're actually going to be able to integrate and differentiate power series, but I just want to do a simple example of an interval of convergence just so we can see how this works. And then I'm going to show you that we can actually integrate and differentiate formally a power series, show you how to do that, and tell you something about how that impacts the uh, radius of convergence. So you're going to like this. This is this is very straightforward. I don't think it's as nearly as complicated as the Taylor polynomials because we don't have so much to keep up with. So in this case, let's look at the following example. Say we have a general power series, n equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1, and we have a center of 6 divided by n times nine to the nth power. So, so again, this is indeed a power series. The expansion point of the center is six. And then we just move up in, in positive integer powers of x minus six. And then of course we have the, the independent uh, coefficients. So, so again, when we look at a power series, we're thinking, okay, this is, this is one better than the real series. That is, now this is actually a function. So we think within the interval of convergence that this defines a function and we treat it as such. It will have nice algebraic properties of a function. So, so we'll say more about that later, but again, you can treat this just like a function in, in differential equations the solutions to uh, linear differential equations with variable coefficients will be these objects, okay? The solution will be a power series. So that's why it is so important that you learn about the power series now so you can navigate the solution to differential equations by use of power series when you take that course. So now all we have to do is compute R. So let's do that first. And well, that's one of the things and then we'll be well on our way. So remember R is the limit as N approaches infinity of the absolute value of A sub N divided by A sub N plus one. Now, again, just to make it simple, it's probably good just to go ahead and write this out and then we'll pair things up. So let's just go ahead and write the uh, a sub n term, which is going to be negative one 
to the n plus one divided by n times nine to the n. And then we divide. So if you like over here, if it makes it a little bit easier, just write a sub n over here to the side. We always have a varying definition for a sub n depending on the series test we're using. So that's the a sub n. That's all, all of the coefficients that don't involve the x. Okay, that's the a sub n, so to speak. And then we reciprocate it, replacing n with n plus one. So we have n plus one, nine to the n plus one divided by negative one to the n plus two. So this is just like the ratio test, but we're not, we're, we're letting the ratio test exist in the background, okay? We've already seen how we actually use the ratio test to navigate the problem when we confirm what R is. And so we don't have to do that every time, which makes this procedure a lot easier. So now if you like, just go ahead and put the, the negative ones together and the nines together and all the ends. So we have a negative one, n plus one, negative one, n plus two. And then we have the n plus one and we have the n. And then we have the uh, powers of nine. Now, of course, you can streamline your calculations, but it's always good to pair things up and then, then work that way, just so you can check your work. So we have the limit as n tends to infinity. And now notice this just gives us a one over a negative one. So we can just go ahead and apply the absolute values. A lot of students will just say the negatives are gone and just forget them. But for now, let's just be a little bit more particular here. And then of course, n plus one over n, that's fixed. And that's clearly positive. And here we just have a copy of nine that survives when we absorb the nine to the n. So now we can factor the nine and we have the limit as n tends to infinity. Of course, this being one of n plus one over n. Of course, this is our friend. We understand these. We don't have to factor anymore because we've been through that. Uh, we just take the ratio of the leading coefficient since the degrees are equal. So we get a one here. So this is nine times one, which is nine. So in this particular case, what we see is that the radius of convergence in this particular case is indeed nine. So now we're thinking, okay, well, what does this imply? Then, We've got our C here, X minus C. So we have X minus C is less than R. That's what the uh, argument tells us to write at this point. R is not zero, it's not infinity. Uh, so we have the in-between case, so to speak, uh, the interesting case. And so we saw this and then we check the endpoint. So every time you do the power series interval of convergence, all it is required is to compute R first and then solve the inequality like you're in college algebra. And it's much easier that way. Uh, the, the tendency to make careless errors is, is, is limited and, and it's so much more uh, efficient. Uh, again, you choose whichever method you like. I do, however, suggest that this is easier. So now, so since we know what R is, let me, let me not still stay in the abstract and put that as nine. It's clearly R, but we know it to be precisely nine. So now we have negative nine less than X minus six. I always tell my pre-cal kids, you need to understand conjunctions, especially when you get the limits in Cal one. So now we can add uh, six to all size. So a negative three plus six, excuse me, a negative nine plus six is a negative three. And then of course a six plus nine is a 15. So this gives us an interval of convergence uh, centered at six that runs nine units in either direction to 15 and negative three. So that's where we start. So at this point, 
we're right here. We're right here. So we need to see, do we get any one of these three? So the, the, the logic here is, is in everything that I have done uh, in this class from the beginning, everything is set in logic and you have to write your mathematics. So it's important that you continue to practice this. I don't do this for my health. I do this to educate you in how to write good mathematics. Now, let's just check and you can pick any order you want. So let's say check X equals negative three. So you could do these all day long. So now what we do is we go to the original series and just replace X with negative three and look at the real series. So we have negative one to the N plus one. Then we have negative three minus six to the N. And then we have N times nine to the N. So these are like doing integrals. Just a lot of busy work, not, not overly difficult. Nothing we've done is overly difficult, just busy work, just, just like doing integrals, you know, making things table ready. So now we have what, negative one to the n plus one. Now notice here we have a, a negative nine to the n. So if you like, you can, let me, let me just do this. And then the result here to make it cleaner is that we will write this as negative one to the n and nine to the n to make that a little bit easier to work with. So that'll be the next step. I didn't wanna just do that the first time without uh, kind of showing you how I want to do this. So again, just, just court reporting basically, busy work. So we have negative one to the n plus one and now we can write the nine as negative one times nine. So that'll give us a negative one to the n and a nine to the n. And then we have n times nine to the n. So this again is just basic, basic simple arithmetic, nothing, nothing difficult. Now, if we look here, the nine to the n's absorb. And then of course here, the powers add, we have the same base. So we get negative one to the, uh, 2n plus 1. The nines absorb and we have an n. Now, this is where we have to think modular arithmetic, kind of like teaching the kids about modulo 2 pi, even though that's a very difficult topic for them to, to uh, master. Uh, but, but Professor Ron keeps trying. So now notice parity is based on uh, even and oddness. And so two times anything or an integer, positive integer is, is a multiple of two. So it's congruent to zero mod two. So this is just gonna be a negative one hereafter, or you can just say two n plus one is always odd. So this is just negative one forever. So we just have a very simple series. It doesn't alternate anymore. So we have negative one over n, and this gives us the negative of n equal one to infinity of one over n. So this is just the negative of the divergent harmonic series. So instead of diverging to positive infinity, it diverges to negative infinity, excuse me. So this clearly diverges. Now, why do we know this? Because this is our famous example that we do uh, by the integral test but we don't do it every time. This is what we know. This is one of our tools of convergence theory uh, that again, I don't want you to feel like you have to reinvent the wheel every time. So utilize this fact. So we clearly aren't gonna include negative three because this series does not converge at negative three. It certainly does for all the numbers in between negative three and 15, at least for now. Now let's check 15. Now you can always just throw caution to the wind and kind of stare at it and, and think, well, I, I got this, but it's good to check. Now, let's just go back to the original series and write this down. So we have N equals one, 
to negative one, n plus one. Again, this is just very straightforward. Don't, don't make this harder than it is. It's just substituting the value of x. And the recipe I've given you here is very easy to follow. Um, the whole idea is that everything should be connected and make sense. So now, instead of here, notice we just get the positive nine. So we don't get the negative one that's going to affect the alternating. So now we just get n equals one to infinity, negative one to the n plus one, but now we just get nine to the nth power and then n times nine to the nth power. Now I can move this back up. We had to see that, so let me shift this back up. And so now the nine to the n's are the exponential portions absorbed and we get n equals one to infinity, and we clearly have an alternating series. Now, now, of course, we look at this and say, well, for this particular series, we'll just call it b sub n, not to confuse it with the a sub n up here. We say this is one over n, and this is clearly non-increasing. The values do not get bigger, clearly. This, this gets smaller as n gets larger, for instance, we could just say, if you want to do a really quick argument here, you could say n is less than or equal to n plus one, and then reciprocate, and we get, <clears throat> excuse me, one over n plus one, in this case, will be less than or equal to one over n. <clears throat> this is b sub n, and this is clearly b sub n plus one. So this is clearly non-increasing. The terms don't get bigger. So that's a quick uh, test of that. <clears throat> and now, of course, this is our standard limit from calculus one, the one over x, the limit as n tends to infinity of one over n equals zero. So now with the non-increasing and the limit of zero of the b sub n, this converges by alternating series test. Now, how much time that you put into this part is up to you. <clears throat> if you've done plenty of examples with these tests, so you can probably work through them fairly quickly, but make sure that you test these and, and you're certain that you should include a particular number. So now when we write the interval of convergence, we do include the 15. So now interval of convergence. In this case, we exclude the negative three, but we include the positive 15, so we have a bracket. So this is, this is where I've said all along, uh, students in pre-cal often say, oh, well, WebAssign got this wrong. And, and my comment, as you well know, is that WebAssign is highly accurate and formatting must be followed. And they still struggle with approximation and exact, but as, as you well know, uh, when, you, when you type your mathematics, you have to be precise with it. And so be careful once you actually do your work that you check your typing and then go back through your work before you hit submit so you have a, have a quality uh, response. Kind of like you're, you're working at a big plant and, and, and if you make a mistake, your boss may say, well, why did you do that? Well, I was, I was nervous. Well, if you get nervous, get your colleagues over to help you out and, and, and check what you do. Unfortunately, tests are not a group effort, so you have to compose yourself and, and recheck things. Okay, so the, the idea of a power series converging is all tied to the concept of radius of convergence in conjunction with the ratio test. So what we're seeing here, if the ratio test is valid and if the theory of the geometric series is valid, then the intervals of convergence must be symmetric about the expansion point C. And so that tells us how power series converge. And so, so now we're always going to be looking at something like this when R is finite. That's it here and forevermore. It will never change. 
Now, again, if you get zero or infinity, you're off the hook. You don't have to do any of this. This is clearly the more uh, tedious case. So just remember, once you figure out the radius of convergence, you have and you have a set of x for which the uh, series converges. But you don't necessarily have the interval of convergence until you check the endpoints. So that's something that you have to check. And the time when you think, ah, oh, it's not going to converge because that's based on the geometric series. I know it's not going to work. The time you decide to not check is when it does work. So, so I, I usually just tell students, do a quick check. Even if you think it's not going to work, just do a quick check to, to convince yourself of the validity, validity and then uh, move forward. So again, very straightforward. Kind of think about this as uh, limits with the calculus two twist, so to speak. Now, there's one concept that we need to cover that has to do with power series and the operations that we use in calculus, namely differentiation and integration. And so this is something that we need to talk about. So, so it's, not, it's not something that is overly uh, difficult but since we're going to consider a power series to define a function in the interval of convergence, it would make sense that we would necessarily integrate and differentiate the functions. So we'll say something like this, within the interval of convergence, within the interval of convergence, the power series defines, at least in our case, a real value function, a real value function of a real variable. Again, all the problems are the same. The, the techniques are few in this section. All the problems are the same. Um, and so uh, we can formally differentiate and integrate a power series in the interval of convergence. So what we do is we use the formal uh, notation for function. So, so I could say now, instead of writing S of X, I could just write F of X. So we'll just say uh, four, x minus c in absolute value less than r. So we're just going to focus now on a finite interval of convergence. And then, you know, you can think of r as being zero, where it would only uh, work at, at c. And then you could think of this as being an infinity. But this kind of covers all the cases with all the different r's. We're going to let f of x be the notation for our convergent power series. So we'll do a sub n, x minus c to the n. So convergent power series. Again, outside the interval of convergence, we don't know what we have. And, and that's often a problem if we can't verify something, you know, you could say, well, we need to make sure that this series actually converges to a function that we know and love, you know, or that we understand it to be or hope that we understand it to be. So, so there, there are tricks that we have to employ and certain theories we have to employ to actually verify things. Often, you know, we, we may end up with a function that we don't know anything about, but, but that's okay. Uh, as long as we uh, have a way to tabulate it, uh, we're fine. And maybe that would be the best that we can do. 
So in this particular case, for instance, if we differentiate, so this is the first case, we'll do the easy case first, and then we'll do an indefinite integral. And I'll try to be a little bit more precise about that and how we can uh, make our work a little bit simpler uh, when we deal with an integrated power series. So formally, we would need to be able to switch the calculus operation and the summation if this is gonna work. And within the uh, interval of convergence, it works because the power series has uniform convergence. And so when you take advanced calculus, you'll spend more time with that concept. And this will be a, a great place to, to work on it. So we have the derivative with respect to X of N equals zero to infinity, A sub N, X minus C to the N, and then just move everything inside. Again, if this is gonna work formally, we have to be able to do this. And so, so if you like, I'm using the Leibniz notation, you could just use primes, but this is a little bit more formal. Otherwise you could just put like parentheses with a little prime mark, but this will work. So we formally differentiate the general term, so to speak, by the interchange here. And so then what does that give us? So just using the power rule, the a sub n being independent of x, we'll get a sub n times n. Now, what I usually do, I write, I write the n first so it doesn't get confused with the subscript. So we can say n a sub n x minus c to the n minus one. So a formal differentiation of the general term. But then of course, this won't be a re-indexing. We just see when n is equal to zero, that zeroes out the general term. So we can just start the summation at one without making any uh, major uh, changes. So we can just say that this equals the series n equals one to infinity since the first term would be zero. Certainly it isn't wrong to write it that way, but it's a little bit uh, silly to have the zero term, but silly in mathematics is often good for us. So in convention, when we think about differentiating the power series, now I'll just kind of put a red box around this and put the f prime of x right beside it to get something like this. So you don't have to memorize this formula, just do it formally every time you differentiate. Again, um, when we have the general power series like this, we, we just simply think, okay, in general, we have this. When you're doing a specific example, it's probably good just to go ahead and differentiate and convince yourself that everything is in line. But when we look at the general case, this is the form. And since the first term gives us a zero, we just start the sum at, at n equal one, not a re-indexing, it's nothing that complicated. Again, always think about what you're doing and what it means. So this would be the differentiated function, that is the differentiated power series. And of course, the theory has to coincide with how we differentiate polynomials. If it didn't, this wouldn't make any sense because it wouldn't be consistent with the previous theory. So all of this just kind of comes together and you think, wow, this calculus is, is worth studying because it, 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 it actually works. Now, for the second part, this is where I want to do a, a, an indefinite integration where I pick an actual value in the interval of convergence. So what I'm gonna say, sometimes we'll just pick a convenient one so we can get a, a, a constant of a integration to be zero since that makes our life easy. So for instance here, we're gonna pick X sub zero in the interval of convergence. And so I'll write it this way, C minus R, C plus R. Then this is how we state the indefinite integral. We have a fixed lower limit and then the variable upper limit. And then I'll use a T variable. Now, sometimes physicists and even mathematicians just use the same variable and a lot of textbooks will often do that, but that, that can be confusing. So the first time you see it, it's probably better to use a different variable here, just so it uh, makes sense to you. 
So now we're going to go ahead and replace f of t with the power series, but instead of x, we put a t. So we had the integral x of zero to x, and we have our power series n equals zero to infinity a sub n t minus c to the n. And so this is exactly what we had before if we compare this to this, it's the same thing. And now we do the interchange because the formal, the formal integration will require an interchange of, of integral and summation if this is going to work. So now this will give us the sum n equals zero to infinity, and we'll have the integral x sub zero to x of a sub n times t minus c to the n. You do this once and then you just kind of remember it. This you don't want to have to do all the time unless, unless you are doing a formal calculation and you want to make sure everything's correct. The, the degree of specificity in each calculation has to depend on what you're required to do. And you don't just want to make it up. So if you have to work back through this, don't sweat it. Just do the steps that you know you need to do. So now, of course, this is a power function. So we add one divided by the new power. So if this is going to be consistent with what we've been doing, we do what we've been doing, so to speak. So this will be a sub n t minus c to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. And then, of course, we evaluate x sub 0 to x. And now, of course, we apply the fundamental theorem. So we're going to get a series with an x in it minus a series uh, with an x naught in it, or x sub 0. So apply the fundamental theorem. So now we replace t with x. So n plus 1, n plus 1. And then minus the series where we replace t with x of 0. Now, of course, this is why we set up this integration this way. This uh, particular x of 0 is in the interval of convergence. So this is a convergent real series. So it's just a number. So this is a convergent real series. So what we do at this point is that we just replace the negative of this series with the, with the c. It's a, it's a real number. So we call the negative of this particular real number the constant c just because that's what we use. So now we get, this will say equals, if and only if, so, so in, in this case, what we'll do is we replace the minus of this with C. We just call it the real number C. So that's our constant of integration. So now we get the integral, I'll just go ahead and do this like we have up here in the red box of f of t dt will now be this series plus the constant. So that's how we develop our arbitrary constant because this would be for any x in the interval of convergence and we know there are an uncountable infinite number of those. So that's our arbitrary constant. So we have x minus c to the n plus 1, n plus 1, plus a constant. So this, this looks like what you would expect. That is, when you integrate a series term by term, you add 1, divide by the new power, and you have this constant of integration, which you, in, 
in the computations have to figure out and usually you you pick an element in the interval of convergence that allows you to make this as simple as possible so so that's why we really do like uh, the Maclaurin polynomials and the Maclaurin series, because that means we can usually get the C to be zero, which is just very nice. So the, the Maclaurin polynomial that we, you know, take from the Taylor polynomial by setting C or expansion point equal to zero can turn out to be uh, extremely favorable. So we always like things to be simple. And, and that can be of, of a major help to us. So now, let's just see what we can work with with this. Now, so you're thinking, okay, so we integrate and differentiate, what does that do to R? And the good thing is nothing. Formal differentiation and integration. Formal differentiation and it's not hard to show, formal differentiation and integration formal differentiation and integration of a power series does not change does not change the radius of convergence R. So that's good. That's one less thing you have to worry about. So when you, when you integrate or differentiate a series, you can go ahead and look at the original series, compute R and be done with it and know that it's not going to change. So formal differentiation and integration of a power series does not change R. So compute R, R with original series. So there's no need to look at the differentiated, you could, you could compute it with the differentiated series or the integrated series, you'll get the same thing. But since the case is, is that theoretically, these formal operations do not affect, affect the uh, radius of convergence. So, so just save yourself the trouble and go ahead and figure out the infinite series, excuse me, the radius of convergence for the, from the original series, that is the original power series. So this is, a, this is a nice result and easy to formalize. You can look in your notes for that, just a, another ratio test, which is easier than what we just did. So, so the, idea, the idea here is that if the radius of convergence is preserved, that's, that gets us off the hook a little bit, but we still have to check endpoints. However, however, we must check endpoints. Again, the theory doesn't tell us anything about the endpoints. So even though we get a little slide on the radius of convergence, we still have to check endpoints and we could possibly include an endpoint uh, that was not included in the original series interval of convergence. So, so this is something that we uh, can't really get away from. Good or bad, it is the way it is. So let's look at an example here, I've got some really good examples of the uh, integration and, and all. Um, before, let's see, uh, let me just go ahead and do one of those, and then I'll come back and do an example uh, with uh, just a general series, just to give you some more estimation practice. And since I just started talking about or finished the conversation about the formal integration and differentiation, I'll go ahead and do an example of that, even though this other example is really neat. Um, here we go. So let's just let's just try this out. So we have compute intervals of convergence. I'm going to say let's compute the interval of convergence for the integrated series. So compute 
interval of convergence for the integrated series. So if we just kind of do it in general with no limits of integration, we just write it in the kind of sloppy notation. If we want to integrate a series and we're not going to specify the actual um, limits that is, you know, and convert to T or whatever, we can be slack and just do it that way. And that's usually an easier notation. But we'll go ahead and utilize the, the strict notation that we uh, set up before. Now, here's the actual problem. So we have f of x in this case is the following power series. So we have n equals 1 to infinity. We have negative 1 n plus 1. And then we have our expansion point of 8 to the n divided by n. So again, n equal 1 to infinity, alternating negative 1 to the n plus 1 times the expansion factor x minus 8 to the n divided by n. Now, like I said here, the radius of convergence doesn't change. So let's go ahead and do, before we actually focus on the endpoints, let's just go ahead and get the radius of convergence for this and then we'll integrate formally. So first, r will be the limit as n passes to infinity of a sub n divided by a sub n plus one. So we have the limit as n passes to infinity and so again, this is real simple. We did the, the a sub n, that'll just be negative one to the n plus one divided by n. So now if you want, we can just go ahead and write down the original a sub n to make it simple just to visualize right there. And now reciprocate it and do the n plus one. So this will give us n plus one and then negative one to the n plus two. So now we have the limit as n passes to infinity. So of course, let's get all of our negatives together. So we get negative one n plus one, negative one n plus two, and then of course the n plus one over n, that's positive, so we can just write this way. Now, of course, this absorbs, uh, we get one over negative one, which is clearly uh, one. So we get the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of negative one times n plus one over n. Of course, this is one. So this gives us the limit as n tends to infinity of n plus one over n. And that's something we've seen before, ratio of leading coefficients one. So the radius of convergence in this case is one, and it's also the radius of convergence for the differentiated series and in our specific case, the uh, uh, integrated series. Now our expansion point is negative eight, or excuse me, positive eight. Let me just write that C equals eight. If it were plus, it would be a negative eight. So this implies, x minus eight, less than one, equivalently, negative one, just like we're doing calculus one with their limits. That was always a lot of fun to teach. It's a, it's a, it's a challenging topic for students. So now we add eight to all sides. So eight plus negative one is a seven. And then of course, eight plus one is a nine. So now what we see is we get an interval of convergence from seven to nine, at least in terms of where we know the series converges. So, so since R is the same, the expansion point is the same, we know that this series 
converges here also. But now we've got to check, we've got to check to see, okay, do we include endpoints? So we have to integrate in, in order to do that. So now integrate. So we're going to do, and I'm I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to be I'm going to be real lazy here. So so let me show you let me show you how the theory can help us out. Notice here we have an eight. I mean when we look at the interval here, at least devoid of the endpoints, we have seven, and we have a nine, and then we got eight right in between. So let's just go ahead and choose the x of zero to be eight because that's gonna zero this out. And we won't even have to check what the arbitrary constant is because we've got this to work with. In more general cases, we'd have to check, but let's use it. So in this case, we will set X sub zero equal to eight, because that's gonna zero out the series even if we integrate it. So now this implies the integral, and we have f of t now, we're gonna go from eight to x dt. So now that we know we move everything inside, we can go ahead and do that. So we have the series, we can cut out that step. We know the formal integration allows us to exchange the integral and the summation. So this will be n equals one to infinity. And we have the integral, eight to x negative one n plus one x oh let me stick with the new variable t minus eight to the n divided by n dt and now we add one divide by the new power so we use our Cal one. Thank goodness for calculus one. I guess we'd, we'd be in trouble if we didn't have Cal one for this class. Can you imagine taking Cal two and skipping Cal one? Impossible, right? So we have what negative one to the N plus one, T minus eight to the N plus one. And now N plus one joins in. And we evaluate between eight and X. So now we replace X or T with X. Let me make sure that looks like a T. So we had the series N equals one to infinity, negative one N plus one, X minus eight N plus one, divided by n plus one times n. And then the last one, and I'll just show you what we get, but I'll write it out. n equals one. We just have to make sure that everything does, in, does zero out, that we don't have some straggling terms, which often happens in differential equations, but we check for that here. So then we just get what, eight minus eight. So this is just a convenient choice for the x of zero, just to, just to make our life easier. Now notice when n is equal to one, we just get uh, two here. So we have zero squared. So for all values of n, this term will always be a zero. We don't get like a, a zero power of this or something that, that, would, that would manage to mess up things and give us indeterminate form or whatever. So, so what we see here is that for this particular choice, this is, this is gone. So we have, we have, now we see that this is a zero. So we, we made a good choice here for our X of zero. So this will give us N equals one to infinity. So we have a C of zero, negative one, N plus one, X minus eight to the N plus one divided by N plus one times n. So this is zero. And so our integrated series is exactly this. So we evaluated the constant here 
by a judicious choice of x sub zero. So when we think about this, if we've got a particular series that we're not completely doing in the abstract, then, then we can choose a nice x of zero to give us that quickly. And that's what I'm doing here. So when I looked at these examples, I thought what would be a simpler way to go ahead and help the students figure out what this is. Just choose, go ahead. Now, of course, if you don't compute the uh, R first and look at this, you don't know to do this. So this is something I thought about. I'm like, you know, wh why does everybody have to walk around in the dark? Let's just look at this first and then see, then see, well, do we add the endpoints? At least we know we have these numbers. So pick a, a very useful X sub zero to run this through. So there, here's our integrated series. Now let's check the endpoints. We'll be done with the problem. Again, technique is what you want it to be. You, you, you think about what the mathematics tells you and then move it forward. Uh, in, in, a, in an efficient way as much as you can. Efficiency is great, but sometimes we just have to work through the tedium. So now um, let's just check the endpoints. So we've got, let's see, what do remember? Let me just write up here. So we have check. Remember we have a seven and a nine. So we have check X equals seven. So what I'm gonna do here, so you can see this, I'm just gonna move this Here's our, well, here's the series right here. Let me just move it here. There's a series right there and we're gonna substitute X equals seven. This is so nice to have a document cam. Boy, I, I, I really hit the jackpot with this document cam. I'm, I'm very grateful. So we had negative one, N plus one, seven minus eight to the N plus one, and we have n plus one times n. So differentiation is done the same way. The integration is just more complicated. So that's why I wanted to do this. So now we get, well, let me, let me push this up for now. We'll come back to it. I'll move this over so you can see it. So we have n equals one to infinity. So we have negative one to the n plus one. And now of course we just get negative one here negative one to the n plus one. So we have n plus one times n. So now of course we can add the power so we get two n plus one. Divided by n plus one times n. Now, of course, this is exactly what we had before. The two n is just congruent to zero. This is always an odd number, so that's always a negative. So this just gives us the series negative one, n plus one times n, n equals one to infinity. Or if you like, you can just go ahead and factor the negative and just focus on the positive generating term or just leave it alone, it doesn't matter. Either way, we're in good shape. So if this, if this series converges, we can either look at this or this, it won't matter. So, so since I want to focus on the positive term series uh, test that we had before, I'm gonna go ahead and extract this. So I'm thinking limit comparison. So now, we look at this, if you like, as the uh, a sub n. So we're gonna set, or, or we could just do direct comparison. That might even be easier. I think, you know, when you, when you do, when you think direct comparison, you don't have to do a limit comparison test. So look at it this way. Here's a real simple one. Just say, observe. That way I don't have to look at the limits. I'll just change it up. Observe that n squared, is less than or equal to, uh, in this case, n plus one times n, where n is greater than or equal to one. Now we can reciprocate. So we have one over n plus one times n is less than or equal to, of course, this is positive. 
1 over n squared. So now this is even, this is simple since it is simple. So, so now we say uh, this series converges. This is a P equal two. So we have N equals one to infinity, one over N square convergent, convergent as P equals two. So this means, so this converges. So by direct comparison test, this must converge. Thus, n equal one to infinity of one over n plus one times n converges, converges, well, that is kind of hard to see. Converges by direct comparison test. Now, of course, if this converges to a real number, so we just take the negative of the real number and so this this is good. So so basically we see that the given series converges for x equals seven. So that's a good. That means that means we include the seven. Now let's check the other one. We need to check the nine. So now you can see what we need to do. So let's just go ahead and uh, let me put this up here so you could see it. There's the integrated series right there. So check n equals nine. So we'll just replace x with nine. So this is where you really get to review everything you've learned in chapter nine. So this is, this is a good summative process makes it easy. It's just like when you do the integrals in chapter in Cal 1, then you get to the integration techniques and you're always going back to the basics in uh, Calculus 1. So now, now we have an even simpler case. We have n equals 1 to infinity. But now, of course, the 9 minus 8 is just a 1, and that 1 to the n plus 1 power is clearly 1. So we just have negative 1 to the n plus one divided by n plus one times n. Now, of course, you're thinking that should converge. Well, let's just check. Notice here, we can let this particular series, for this particular series, we'll just call it b sub n equals one over n plus one times n. And we can use, we can use the same, uh, the same uh, setup that we had before. So first note that n plus one times n is less than or equal to, bump everything up by one, n plus two times n plus one. Now reciprocate. So we have one over n plus two times n plus one. This will be B of N plus one. And this will be, in this case, uh, things will, uh, will, will flip around. And this will be less than or equal to one over N plus one times N, which is B sub N. So now we see that this is clearly non-increasing. So non-increasing. So that's a real simple argument without having to take a derivative. Derivatives are easy, but when the when the numbers are simple like this, we can just use basic inequalities. And then of course, the limit as n passes to infinity of one over n plus one times n. Of course, now the, the dominant term is the n squared and one over n squared goes to zero. So this is clearly zero since uh, n squared dominates in the denominator. And so now this series must converge by alternating series test. Thus, n equal one to infinity of negative one n plus one divided by n plus one times n converges by 
alternating series to this. So in both cases, what we're seeing, we started out with the original series. Again, doing the radius of convergence was actually wise in this case. You don't have to get crafty about trying to compute the constant of integration. It would still work. But since the R does not change, compute it first and, and go ahead and figure out the values of X that you get for free, okay? You get that for free. You know that the integrated or the differentiated series will converge here. That's a given because the R does not change. So what we have to do is once we have this, we integrate and see what the integrated series looks like. And then we apply uh, test to the endpoints. And in both cases, we get convergent real series. So this implies the interval of convergence interval of convergence is again 79 inclusive so the the process here is more busy than it is tedious um, once you figure out the construct of a radius of convergence and the symmetry aspect that must ensue based upon the expansion point or center of the power series, all of the theory is actually quite simple. It's almost like this is very similar to the geometric progression or the geometric series. Once you know it's geometric, you're done. You know what's going on. It's kind of like getting a quadratic equation and saying, well, I'm done. I know everything there is to know about a quadratic equation. So, so the, the theory of the power series is, is really uh, very straightforward. Once you uh, uh, center on the concept of the radius of convergence. So, so there's, a, there's a beauty in how these particular series converge. And hopefully this is, this is setting home to you. And actually you're seeing that all the stuff you've done before is, is basically what you do when you check the endpoints, because at this point, the, the, the series become real series. You're just looking at series of real numbers. There are no X's hanging out. So, so what we're thinking of, when we, when we call a power series a function, it clearly has the variable, just like any real value function of a real variable. But then we're often interested in checking particular points, but since our series is, is, is defined, you know, our function is defined as a series, there's more work involved here, okay? is a lot more work. And so, 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 like I said before, this section allows you to review what you've learned before and then even get that much better at it. Now, what I wanna do is look at an example that comes up often in, in the theory of, uh, power series and a, a particular product. And when we get to our uh, binomial series, which will be kind of the, the ultimate uh, analysis in this class, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see it again. The only thing is right now is that I'm gonna kind of hang back with the, with the analysis of it uh, and, and hold off on a nice combinatorial formula because at this point it won't do us any good. The thing about determining convergence and all is the ability to look at patterns and, and what does that pattern tell us? And if we, can't, if we can't negotiate a pattern, ladies and gentlemen, you know this, it's like doing an integral. If we can't, if we can't negotiate a pattern, then, then we, we struggle with an, an attempt to further the process. So we want to do the same thing with this example. So this is just a power series interval of convergence, um, just, just as it is. We're not going to integrate or differentiate. We're just going to analyze it, but it's going to require us to do a little bit more work. So I want to say compute, but not a lot of work. It's easy. Uh, don't get me wrong, it's, it's not like super simple, but you can do it. So compute the interval of convergence. So what do we have here? Well, here's the series. 
and it's going to have that product in it. N equal one to infinity, n factorial. I'm going to show you some interesting techniques here. X plus five. So now the center is negative, uh, negative five because we have the plus to the n. And then we're dividing by a product of n factors, but all of the factors string through with the odd integers. So we have one times three times five, and we ascend to two n minus one. So that will give us n factors of odd positive integers. Now, there's a, there's a formula that we're going to talk about later uh, that, that's going to be of, of, of interest to you. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it over here. Uh, this will be something we talk about later. I'm not going to use it now, but, but when I started looking at this problem, I thought, let me just go ahead and, and give this to you all so you can put it in your notes. We'll talk about it later. You can actually write this product in a combinatorial fashion, even though we're not using it in this proof. You're thinking, that's a help. 2n quantity factorial divided by 2 to the n times n factorial is actually a way to write this finite product. And we will use this with the binomial series to make our formulas look nice and pretty, uh, you know, after we do all the dirty work. So this will be something we're going to talk about later. Right now, you look at that and say, well, that looks insane. But it actually can be. You could prove this algebraically or prove it by induction. Um, but, but this is true. WebAssign actually throws this out when you're doing your binomial uh, expansions in the last section of this chapter. And I thought it was kind of remarkable that they do this. Uh, Dr. Larson, I don't think mentions this in his textbook. I haven't seen it. I need to check. Uh, but I see this in the web assign, and I think it's really quite remarkable that it's there. That's just a little extra for now. Don't worry about it now. Just kind of put it there, and we'll talk about it later. So now what we want to do is look at this and say, okay, what's the interval of convergence? So now the a sub n, let's just write it down. This will be n factorial divided by the product, one times three times five to two n minus one. Now, of course, if we wanted to write the, the product right, the factor right before it'd be two n minus three and then two n minus one, just to give you a little extra about what's going on there, okay? So now we want to uh, compute the radius of convergence. So by definition, R will be the limit as n tends to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n divided by a sub n plus one. So, well, you know, you're thinking, what happened to the plus and minuses? Well, they're not there. So that means we're going to have to work harder. So in this case, a sub n, we get n factorial. I'll spread this out a little bit since we have lots of factors. So we have one times three times five to two n minus one. Now we reciprocate this and replace n with n plus one. Now, of course, now this is going to ascend to two n plus one when we replace n with n plus one. So we get one times three times five to 2n minus 1. And then, of course, the 2n plus 2 minus 1 is 2n plus 1. So that's the, the next odd factor, so to speak. And then, of course, the n factorial becomes n plus 1 factorial. So this technique actually is better, ladies and gentlemen, when you, when you compute the radius of convergence separately. This is a technique that's not normally taught in the text. Uh, I, again, I just think that this is easier and, and more efficient, but you can use whatever you like. I, I certainly recommend this though, however. Now notice, notice in this particular case, um, we can kind of put everything together. And of course we get rid of the absolute values, we don't need them. So we have one times three times five to two n minus one. 2n plus 1. 
equal opportunity and one times three times five, two, two n minus one. And then of course here we have n factorial. And then of course n plus one factorial is n plus one times n factorial. So we can go ahead and use the definition of n factorial uh, to, to rewrite this term. And now notice pretty much everything goes away. This string of factors here absorbs this string of factors. I don't mind if you put boxes around things. That's really good. I do it all the time. Just don't put slash lines through it. That's, the, that's hideous. Why, why would you ever do that? And I don't even understand why it was taught. When I was a kid, they taught it, and I thought that was crazy. I guess they thought I was a math person when I was five years old. But the thing is, is that, that this way, you can see that they clearly absorb, but you don't obliterate the, the, the term. So you can go back and check your work. I, I, again, one of my favorite movies, uh, Good Will Hunting, uh, the genius mathematician, uh, when they're doing a combinatorial problem, they're putting slash lines on the board. I guess that's just for movie or theatrical effect. And I'm thinking, how sad. My students watch this and think, well, we should use slash lines too. Well, that's where I have an exception with that movie. Otherwise, it's a good movie, at least about someone reaching their dreams. But the slash lines have to go. So I've said it. Now, now notice here, what do we have left? We have a 2n plus 1 and an n plus 1. So we have 2n plus 1, n plus 1. Now, of course, we just have basically ratio of leading coefficients. The powers are the same. So the 2n over n is what dominates, and that'll just give us a limit of 2. So basically, ratio of leading coefficients. Now, what does that say? What does that say in this case? I mean, so, so what does the theory tell us? Okay, so we run over here to the x plus 5. That, that is, we have a center of negative 5. So this says, okay, well, this implies that we must have a symmetric interval of convergence about negative 5. So we have x plus 5 less than 2. The theory will not ever uh, uh, do you wrong. It never forsakes you. We forsake the theory because we are human and make mistakes. So we have negative 2 less than x plus 5 less than 2. So we subtract 5 from all sides. So we're going to have negative 2 uh, minus 5, which is a negative 7. And then we have a uh, negative 2 minus a 5, which is a negative 3. So at least here, we see that we get convergence for these real numbers. But what about, what about all the other stuff? What about the, the endpoint? So let's do that. So again, everything is the same. Here, we don't have to integrate or differentiate because we're just looking at the original series, OK? So now we say check, in this case, x equal negative 7. So we have the series, and now I'll just bring this down a little bit so you can see it. We have the series, n equals one to infinity, n factorial, and we have now negative seven plus five to the n. This is where we get to do some nice factoring. And it'll, it'll be easy, a nice, nice argument for you to remember. So now, again, here, we get a negative 2. So just like before, I'm going to think about this as a negative 1 times a 2. So when we raise to this power here, we're going to get alternating. Well, the alternating came out for free, OK? So now, we have n equals 1. Again, remember, we apply the n to the negative 1 and to the 2, 
So we have, let's just go ahead and pull this out. We've got a negative one to the end. Let's just write it here, negative one to the end. And then we have what? N factorial. And then we have a two to the N power. And then we have the odd product. You're thinking this has got to diverge, but again, we need a, we need a, if it's gonna diverge, then we have to use the divergence theorem. So we've got to show that the limit is non-zero of the generating sequence. And that's not hard to do. What I'm going to do is show you a little trick here that actually will get you to that result without having to use this thing, which would not help at all. So what we're gonna do is flesh this out. And this is a standard technique when you work with factorials. So we have this alternating bit. Now we've got n factors of two. And then we basically have one times two times three to n minus one times n. So that's n factorial factor written in factor form right there. And two to the n is just two to the n. So we have one times three times five. And I'll just go ahead and write a couple more. Two n minus three and two n minus one. We got the same number of factors. We have n here, we have n here. But now they're n copies of two, which we can now multiply into each of these factors. Each of these n factors gets a two. So these just become a bunch of even numbers. And this is how we're gonna prove divergence. So we have negative one to the n, and so we get two times a four times a six. And then of course here we get two n minus two. And here we just get two n. Downstairs, I'm just gonna go ahead and pair these up. We get a one, a three, a five, two N minus three, two N minus one. Now, now we can look at the generating sequence here. And this is, what, this is what's interesting about this. Just, just pair everything off the way I have here. Now observe, limit, well, that observe is hard to read, sorry. Let me rewrite that so you can see it. Observe the limit as n approaches infinity. So we have negative one to the n. And now I'm just gonna pair these off. Two over one, four over three, six over five, 2n minus 2 over 2n minus 3, and 2n over 2n minus 1. This limit is going to go into a positive direction and a negative direction, and all of these factors are bigger than 1. This does not equal 0, clearly. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that all of these factors here are bigger than 1. So we're gonna have something getting larger in the positive direction. And then of course, the subsequence, things getting smaller. And so this limit could never be zero. So we're done. So this implies series, and I'm not gonna write this down. I'm just gonna say series diverges. This is one case where I think you know that that's the series and I'm not gonna write it again. Series diverges by divergence test. I mean, if you, if you just look at a subsequence and look at all these positive numbers that are getting bigger, all bigger than one, that limit cannot be zero. It's never gonna happen. So this analysis here, by looking at the products in a very convenient way, will give you the divergence. So you have to be a little bit more subtle. Now let's do the last part. What about 
you're thinking, well, is it going to be, you know, bad news for the other one? So let's do what's the next one? X equal negative three. So check. This is kind of fun if you admit it. I mean, th this is calculus is fun. It's challenging, but it's certainly uh, certainly rewarding. So now here, let me let me put this under here so you can see the actual series. So let's just replace uh, x with uh, negative three. So the key is the radius of convergence. That's what makes it work for us. Negative three plus five to the n, one times three times five, 2n minus 1. So we can use basically the same technique again. So in this case, we've got a 2 here. It's not going to alternate, but that doesn't matter. So if you were looking at that last series as an alternating series, you, you know, the, you can't apply the alternating series test. So you can't say anything. If it doesn't apply, then you, it's not robust enough to tell you that it doesn't work. It just doesn't apply. So we have to use the divergence theorem. It's not like the integral test. That, that, that's the best test since sliced bread, geometric test. I mean, some of the tests are terrific and others are limited. So now we have the series n equals one to infinity, again, the n factorial times the two to the n. So we'll just say two to the n, n factorial, one times three times five, two, two n minus one. Now, since we've done this before, I can go ahead and write out the products like we know it's gonna be. So we're gonna have the two times each of the factors of the n factorial like we had before. So we know that routine. So this is going to give us a two times a four times a six. And, and, and if you like, you can put in an additional factor and I'll put the additional factor down here like we had before. And let me, let me do the, and move Professor Ron over a little bit and do the clarity here. Yeah, that always helps. I haven't done that during lectures. Stay pretty focused, but so, sometimes, I think you all notice it gets a little bit light. So let me let me bring it down just a little bit. But that's a little bit better. Okay, so now let's just go ahead and put in that extra factor, uh, 2n minus 2, and then 2n. And downstairs, I'll go ahead and put in the additional factor as I did before. 1, 3, 5, 2n minus 3. 2n minus 1. So some of you will end up in computer science and you'll take uh, discrete math and combinatorics. And so you'll work a lot more with, with the factorials and these products here. Oh, man. Man. Good old Xfinity there. Steel screen. It's all right. I just, I want everything to be better than it can be, but I'll, 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 I'll be okay. I just don't like that when that happens. So now we can just look at the generating sequence. So we can say the limit as n approaches infinity and just pair them all. It's like we had before, two, one, four, three, six, five. So this doesn't alternate, it just goes in one direction, the positive direction. And now what we see is that all these factors are bigger than one and n tends to infinity. So they just, again, tend to get bigger and bigger. And this cannot be zero. Again, by the same procedure that we had before, in this case, we had two divergent sequences. Here we just have the positive one in this case. Again, this cannot have limit zero. Therefore, this implies series diverges by divergence test. So you're thinking you do all this work 
just to show that you don't include a number. True. I mean, it's like you, you, you think you, you spend half a page of comp computation to see <clears throat> that an equation has no solution. Well, you know that a solution or the fact that there is no solution can be just as valuable. I mean, it, it just depends on the problem you're trying to solve. And so this is extremely valuable to us because if we want the correct interval of convergence, we need to know the real numbers for which the series converges. And we have proven, and we did a proof here, every time we do a math problem, we did a proof that we do not include negative seven and we do not include negative three. So the interval of convergence is as follows. This will just be uh, negative seven to negative three. So it's just as important to include a number as to exclude it. Again, you've got four cases. Once you determine the radius of convergence, you can include endpoints, one or the other, or both. So that gives you four cases. In this case, we got the first one. That is, we did not improve from the initial computation we did not improve this. And, and, and most of you are thinking like, okay, you know, when, when, when you've got your calculator working and you want to be able to focus on certain computations, you know, and, and, and approximations and things, uh, we, will, we will adjust power series to, to move to intervals that are more convenient for us. So the fact that um, functions uh, have all these nice transformation properties, we can do the same with with the power series, we can apply those transformations to actually uh, produce new power series. And, and of course, it will shift or change the uh, interval of convergence, but that's okay. We know how to do that. So, so our college algebra is really having an impact on what we will be doing in this class. That is function transformations are valid for any function, even if the function is written as a power series. So, so I think, I think that while I always go back and say, ladies and gentlemen, the prerequisites are so crucial because all we're doing is the same thing again. We're just adding more information. We, we, we haven't learned that much new mathematics. We're still focusing on functions. And when you finish your bachelor's degree, or some of you may go to work on master's and PhDs, uh, you'll still be studying the same stuff. You just add more, more interesting topics. And, and that way you can you can get a better job, you know, but but at the end of the day, we're still doing fancy arithmetic. Okay, so when it comes to doing the power series, what we're seeing, what we're seeing in this case is that we no longer have to look at a power series and shriek and say, well, you know, it's not geometric, so I don't know what I'm gonna do. All you have to do now is apply the theory that we've shown. Now, you're thinking, where do we head from here? Well, here's where I want to just basically make a few comments to the next section, and then actually do a computation. So this is the next section, and this is very simple. I mean, I just kind of wanna summarize it for now and then start doing some examples. This, this function or this section is entitled representations of functions by power series. Okay, well, I've been giving you an example of a power series. What if we had to flip it around? <clears throat> okay, say we have a function and you're thinking, well, we did Taylor polynomials. Are we gonna be able to extend those? And the answer is yes. We know what Taylor polynomials look for, like uh, for some logarithm terms, uh, sine x, cosine x, some geometric terms. We're like, we can, we can do this, Professor Ron. O okay, so, so basically what we wanna do is keep that concept in mind and extend those infinitely, but I want to share with you some other tricks that will allow us to circumvent the Taylor coefficients, but the result will be the same. Just like I'm gonna say soon, 
in a theorem is that every convergent power series is its Taylor series. So the coefficients that you compute for a Taylor polynomial will coincide with the coefficients that you compute via some other technique. Ladies and gentlemen, if they didn't coincide, then, then we could take all of this and throw it into the garbage can because it wouldn't be worth anything. Mathematics is profound because it is a consistent study of logic, okay? We often get frustrated with Professor Ron because he requires us to write the mathematics. The mathematics is there. We just have to write it down and we have to abide by the rules. So here's another set of rules that is no uh, surprise to us. Within the interval of convergence, the power series is a real valued function. Therefore, power series possess an algebra of functions. I know I sound like a broken record. I've already said that 500 times. And by the time I state the actual theorem, you're gonna think, well, he's lost his mind. He said this for the last two weeks. Well, that's the whole idea of creating the story, ladies and gentlemen. So, so when we think of combining functions, just like we did in college algebra, Remember, if we add two functions, we take the intersection of the domains. We do the same thing here. The domain is now the interval of convergence. And so if we're going to add two power series, we better make sure we're using x's that lie in the intersection of the intervals of convergence. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. One may diverge and one may converge. So the ideas that you adopted in algebra, college algebra, are all the same, are all the same. We're just generalizing the concept. So, so when I speak of these things, and when I teach honors pre-calgebra, the students are like, why do you keep talking about calculus? Because that's really what we're doing. We just didn't, we haven't added the limits yet. So what we can do is just like you do in a college algebra class, we can define two functions for instance, that have an overlapping, that have overlapping intervals of convergence. So we have f of x will be the power series represented here. And just for convenience, we'll use c equal to zero. And then of course, we'll have another power uh, uh, series that represents the function g. And then we'll fix a k as a real number. Now, this is what I was talking about. We can, we can do horizontal and vertical stretching and compression. For instance, if k is between zero and one, we can stretch things. If k is greater than one, we compress, just like we did in college algebra. So if we do this, we just replace x with kx and then use the uh, laws of exponents. So just like college algebra. Now again, maybe, maybe we need a power series in x squared. So we want to replace x with some power of x. Again, an, an integer power because we want a power series. So again, we can replace x with x to the n, some positive integer, use the laws of exponents and create a new power series. Now, just like I said before, we can add and subtract as long as we're looking again at the intersection of the domain. So all of these, here, this just requires that we have some positive uh, content for the interval for f, for its interval of convergence or domain. But then when we start looking at the combination here, then, then we, we do just exactly like we did in college algebra. We add and subtract the generating uh, coefficients or the generating sequences. Now, you're thinking multiplication and division, whatever right here, that's also possible. Tedious, but possible, okay? So, so we, we will maybe not use this as much unless one of the uh, factors that functions is actually finite, you know, so we're not like going on at infinitum. This can be tedious to do, but we can do it just like you did in college algebra. But now instead of having, you know, x plus five times x squared minus six, we have infinite uh, series being multiplied. And then you've got to check term by term and, and that can be very tedious. Now, so, so this is where we're headed. Now, I just wanted to remind you of what we did at the beginning of class. 
Remember our good friend, the geometric progression that doesn't alternate is just one over one minus X. And then the series that we talked about last time via the other computation with the Taylor polynomial was this. And then I showed you how we can rig this to replace X with the additive inverse, kind of like we're doing up here and get a new series. So you're thinking, is this all the story, Professor Ron? No, we're, next class, we're gonna see how we can push this to the limits. We can find all kinds of power series representations using these actual formulas when we tweak the algebra. And then what are we gonna do? We're gonna integrate and differentiate. And we're gonna produce power series of famous functions that have nice integral formulas and nice differential formulas. So here, you're gonna say geometric series is our friend. If there was ever a time when you have to pay homage to the geometric series, it is now. So for our next class, and you might go ahead and look into this section, I want you to, to think about what we're gonna be doing here. And then we're going to, again, take advantage of our knowledge of the geometric series and use integration and differentiation. So thank you for your attendance today. I'll, uh, today I'll get up a quiz uh, for this week. Uh, you all, you know, you got a break last week and I'm thinking you, you, you want another quiz. And so I'll get that up for you. And um, again, if you wanna go ahead and look into some of the remaining sections, I've already posted those. Uh, once we finish series, we'll look into the polar coordinates and the parametric equations, which will be a nice change. I, I don't know if you're going to like it or not. It'll be so different in some capacity that it'll seem like a different course. But, but I hope you're enjoying the, the material on the infinite series and the power series. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot emphasize how important this is to your future, especially as you take more engineering math differential equations, and for some of you, partial differential equations. The infinite series, the power series is, is of utmost importance. So I appreciate your attendance today. Uh, please stay safe. You keep, keep wearing that mask if you have to go outside. I'm doing it uh, when, when we meet at First Presbyterian in the building. Uh, as I'm playing the organ, I have to wear a mask and that makes me crazy, but, but, but it's, that's all to keep people safe. So just remember when you get out and about, uh, to be as safe to, to preserve your health. So uh, if I don't see you at office hours, uh, I'll see you on Wednesday morning. Take care, everybody.